60s. I lived there in the 70s. Right there. London's changed so much in the last 20 years, like every place else. Okay. All right. What I'm going to talk about today, and I may go back next, after, we'll see how it goes next week. I may go back and do a little bit more review of C. But I'm going to make the assumption that the C that you you can muster and what little that we were using in this class, I don't have to spend a, lot, a long time reviewing C. That there. So, but today's lecture is using the F80, the C, the 8051, the Silicon Labs. Now, this is F020. We're using, of course, the 850, which is a slightly different processor. That there, but it, everything we everything's the same here. But that there. So let me kind of go through these slides, and then we'll kind of talk a little bit about that. Then I'll move to interrupts right there. So okay, we're going to be, as I said earlier, most of our projects we're going to be doing in this semester are going to be using C. So now some of the topics that we need to go back and cover, we will that are based in assembly language, but uh, C is our is the primary programming language for embedded systems. You, we spent all last or short semester and the first lab two weeks ago, I think it was, or we can, that they're talking about use, we use the assembly language, that there. Assembly language is important because we need to know it. It's for the rare cases we have to, and probably it shows us the architecture of the microprocessor that there. That same architecture and those same rules carry into C. That there. So we'll kind of look at the flow that there. Now the same registers and the same special function registers and data types and everything that we talked about in assembly language carry into the C. The C we use for the 8051 is different than desktop C. What you, and I don't know who you had for C programming. I started teaching it, I think, last semester that there. I taught over the last, that there. You probably had Suraya, most of you, right? Dr. Suraya from, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know, she's in the communications department now, head of section, but is that who you had for C? Who, which C course did you take? Who was your instructor? You remember who, who taught C when you took C? Nobody remembers. Or, everybody took C, right? C, C computer programming and MATLAB. Oh. You, you know, who, who taught that course? Was that Suraya? Yeah. Okay. All right. That there. Well, whatever Suraya taught you in that class, and since most of you. Didn't even recognize the fact I asked you know, for the C class. As soon as I said computer programming, you forgot that you took C in that C class, right? C is the computer language that you learned in that class. So I call it the C class. That there, not as in the C class Mercedes Benz. That there, which I can't afford to drive one of those. That there, but you know, I'm, you're, I'm, you're going to have to go back and try to remember some of that. That there. So, however. The C that we use for programming the 8051 is a mix between assembly language and C. It looks like C, but it's using a lot of the names and we get down to the low level right there. One of the beauties of C is that it allows us to get down to the register set, allows us to get to the ports directly, allows us to get to everything that we need to, the same way as we do in assembly language, but for example, there is not a predefined predefined variable from Dr. Suraya's course called P1, right? Now P1 we know from assembly language is port one on the mic 8051, so we can write to port one and read port one with the the C language for the 8051. Visual she used was a Dev C plus plus I think it was or or Visual Studio for her for for the, when you took computer programming, you probably used FC++ since I haven't found a working version of, uh, of Visual Studio that works very well here. But regardless, whatever C programming you took that there was 
strictly for desktop computers right there. You didn't control hardware. This class is computer microcontroller interfacing, so we're going to be writing C programs that we can turn on LEDs, turn on motors, read A to D ports, things like that with. So we're going to be doing that with C. So before we can do that with C, we need to look at what C looks like on the 8051. And it does feel a little different, and you'll get a chance next week to do a relatively simple C lab where you can read a port and write to a port type type thing that there's I haven't wrote the lab yet but it's going to be a relatively straightforward one that there so but this lecture here just kind of goes through that there our our code generation flow is very similar we wrote code in the assembler then we would build it right there and that would go through and invoke the assembler so we can assemble the code annually most of the time we just hit the build that combine this function and this function right there. Now what the assembler does is it takes our assembly code, runs it through the assembler, and ends up with the object code. Here we go through what's called a compiler that generates the object code. These two are the same type of code that there. One major difference between assembly language and C code, or the assembler and the compiler, is that uh, there. Hopefully, anybody else shows up. They, she used to have a bunch of plastic chairs back there. What happened to our extra plastic chairs back there? So, okay, one major difference is that between assembly code and object code, this is what. And brand new battery. I think I'm going to have to break down and buy a new pen. Actually, the note or the Surface Five is supposed to be out next spring, so I'll. Gives me excuse to buy a new computer, right? <laughs> that there, that there. This computer is reaching about three years old, but this is a one-to-one -one translation. When I say one-to-one, -one, and let me make my ones look like ones, means that when I write assembly language, the object code that comes out of the assembly language is always going to be the same, no matter what assembler I use. That there. Here the compiler will interpret interpret that and that just that's supposed to be the word interpret but I ran out of room that there but it will interpret that not every C compiler will give you the same object code right there and you make minor changes in the C code it may make major changes in the object code right there so and the compiler, depending on the type of compiler, it may even remove whole blocks of code from your code. You know, the compiler may look at a function that you have called delay and may decide that you're not doing anything in delay and just delete it right there. So you have to be careful with compilers right there. Now, there are two compilers that are available for the 8051. There's actually more than that, but two that are commonly used. The one we're using is by a company called Kyle, right there. K-E-I-L is the name of the company that manufactures the compiler. And we're using a free compiler that has limitations of how large the code we're going to do. It's, so they, they Silicon Labs, when you download their, their software, it comes with a free version of Kyle that allows us to write for, you know, write code up to 4K in size, right there. So the idea is it's for educational use and experimental use, right there. If we wanted to do it for a commercial product, and it's a full-blown 8051 design that's going to be 30, 40K size, that they're a big, a big design, then you have to buy the full version of Kyle, which is about 10,000 plus ringgits, right there. I have a full version. I, I kind of, I didn't. I won't say I pilfered, but I, I was the only one to use it my last campus, and they quit using the the 8051. So I took the Kyle compiler from my last campus and brought it with me. So I got one full version that's like two versions out of date. It's that there. So I do have a full version if I wanted to do a full that there. I it's requires a software doggle, so it's not you know. It has to be registered with them to a particular computer, so it's not available for student use. <laughs> that there. 
but none of us are going to be writing anything larger than 4K in this class, right there. And so this is your last microcontroller course. Even if you did a final year project using the 8051, I would doubt if your code would go beyond the 4K size. Most of our programs are down in the 300 byte range. So 4K is about 10 times as large as anything we're going to write. So we're perfectly fine. Another one is called the G GCC right there. That's a open source C compiler for the 8051. It's not as nice and the syntax is different so we won't talk about that. But there's other C compilers out there. So that there, every version of the C compiler is going to give you a different type of object code out depending on which version you use that's there. And as I said you make minor changes in your C code, it can ch completely change the way it's organized in object code up there. So this is not a one-to-one. -one. So when you're debugging that there and you're looking at the assembly language code, it may or may not look like your C code right there. Because this will actually go through and it will generate a type of assembly language, then go through the create the object code that there. So the compiler takes your C code and generates an assembly language from it and then creates the object code right there. And the reason it does that is that assembly language is one-to-one -one compatible or one-to-one -to, -one to the object code. So it goes through the assembly language first. If it doesn't do that, then you can always go back with the object code and disassemble it and, and, ge and generate the assembly language code from the object code. So you can go back and forth between object code and assembly code. Right there, there's a disassembler. This slide doesn't talk about this. There's not a disk compiler. Not there. So then we go through the linker. Now the linker is the second part of the build operation. Now you can do the same thing when you write a C code is you can assemble or compile and link with just the build button. The build does both or you can compile it first. If you start getting errors, typically, you know, during the build operation, sometimes I say, do the compile first and see, because the compiler gives you better errors, you know, messages than the build operation, because when you get the build operation, it tells you that the, that the files are missing, that's there. And that's the only error it's got. So you try to uh, compile the code first, right there. And I'll go through a demo before I assign the lab next week, that there. And then what comes out of the linker is our machine code, and this is what we download. When we do the download to the board, that's the machine code that we're downloading right there. So the code generation flow is a little different between the assembly that there. We've been doing this already on this side right here. Now we're going to do it on this side here. This is a really simple C code. Now notice that this doesn't look anything like what you had with Dr. Suraya. That there. EA is enable interrupts right there. That is a that is a register in, in, the, in the special function registers. It's actually a single bit there that's defined in whatever definition file we have. So we include this definition file. We'll talk about that in a minute there. But we always include the special function declarations. That's a file that lists all the special functions for the 8051C850. We won't include this one. We'll include the one that says 850 that there, not the 020 that there. So we include the one that says 850 right there. Include special function de declarations right there. First thing we do is we disable all the global interrupts. We disable the watchdog timer. Yeah, and I think I talked about the last song, watchdog timer. I'm going to talk about it again later at there because we're going to. I'm going to make you use it this, later this semester. Semester, and then we re-enable the interrupts. And then this particular program does nothing right there. It does like I do on a Saturday, right there. It does absolutely nothing right there. It just simply says while one is equal to one, just stay here and do nothing. Right there. So, but this is the basic format. Now you'll notice that it has our function main 
like any C program go, does. Main is the program that when we download this to the board and we turn the board on, this is the program that gets executed in our board. Right there. When you were taking C from Suraya, it was the program when you said run that it would run right there. So, or if you compiled it and put it on your hard drive and you ran the program from your hard drive, that's the program that would run right there. You know, the function that would run. And again, we're going to write other functions right there. But this is a very simple C structure right there. Now, let me kind of go over the structure that there. The first thing we have here, yeah, let me erase a lot of this right here before I go through this here. The first thing we have is we have our header, and this is our comments right there. So this is where you would put your name, the assignment number, date, those types of things. This particular case, all it says is this is a blank C program that is, does nothing other than disable the watchdog timer right there. Our includes go next. This is our includes. Actually, this is wrong. This is our header right here. This is our includes. We only have one include here. You probably included something like standard IO.h when you took C before. Anybody ever see this include stdio.h? Anybody remember that? that there? You might include something like called math.h right there. These are our include files and they contain various headers or things like that. For right now, I just included the C8051F. 850 is what we would include right there. And actually, the underscore defs is not required. That's There's another file with that there. But that includes all the special function registers. This tells the compiler what special function registers our microcontroller has right there. So then we start off here. It's not here, but in here we would have any function headers. And we'll have that later. This particular do nothing program doesn't have any functions that it calls. And then we have main. This is our main program. Then under that would be our functions. Right there. If we had any functions to add right there. And of course we're going to have functions that we're going to write up there as well. So this is our simple C structure right there. So our register definitions right there. A key word here of a type is special function register. This tells the compiler that port 0 is at location 8080 right there. Now we could go back to your, our early discussion on the special function registers. I think it was like week one or week two, I went through all the special function registers briefly right there. And they're all listed in this particular file right there. This means that we don't have to remember where they're at right there. So I can say that A is equal to port zero right there. And whatever is on port zero is moved into the variable A. I could say B is equal to two times port zero, or two times A. And then I could say port one is equal to B, and I could write that out to port B right there. So I could take whatever is on port A, double it, and put it out on port B with, the, with those simple commands right there. Doing that in assembly language would be more, far more difficult right there. And I could even do that all with one line, and I could even write a line. I don't know what's going on with my pen here, but I could just write a line that says port 1 is equal to 2 times port 0 right there. <laughs> and that just simply reads port 0, multiplies it by 2, and writes it right back onto port 1. If you did that in an assembly language, that would be a much more difficult process. And also notice that we get multiplication. In assembly language, trying to multiply with a major pain in the neck, right? So doing any kind of simple operation is much simpler with C right there. Now this 
we'll probably, if we were to do this in assembly language, we would have to move port port zero into a register, copy that to A, move two to port B, do multiply A B, and then move port. Yeah, you know, we're going to assume that we're just going to we're going to keep it at eight bits, and we're going to move the lower eight bits there, which is in port A, and move that out to port one right there. So we it take us like six commands, five or six commands to do this in assembly language. We do it with one line in C. So the reason we use C is that it makes our code much simpler and easier to understand what's going on right there. So many of the newer 8051 derivatives like ours, and we can put 850 here, use two special function registers with the second address to specify 16-bit variables, the values, so that they're, now again, if they're none of the 16-bit, and there are, they are not 8-bit or bit addressable. We won't worry so much about bit addressable versus not bit addressable when we're in C, other than the fact that some of ours are bit addressable, and which means we can only assign them to 0 or 1 right there. So here's our very, very common things right here. This is standard ANSI C right there, the top. These are our normal right there. Now, unsigned int is 16 bits. They're saying that some compilers will make this 32 bits right there. So ours will make it 16 bits. But if you're using a different compiler, it may make your signed and unsigned integers 32 bits right there. Right there. So our longs are four, are four bits. So if we want four bits for a number, we have to assign it as a long. So, and neither signed or unsigned. Right there. Float is still four bits right there. Or four bytes, excuse me. And then we have two, four new ones. One is a bit and an S bit right there. And they're actually the same right there, S bit that there. And then we have special function registers as a new type. That's an 8-bit variable right there. And special function registers means that it equates to an address in the special function register set right there. And such an address is right there. For example, port 0 is a 8-bit address and it's port zero right there, or port zero, and that's at location 80. Now, the advantage, one of the key advantages of using this include is you don't have to remember where all these special function registers are in that set. Right there. Ah, not there. So, we know that the enable interrupt is at address A8. And if you remember back in our early days, we had this, those special function registers, they all, all had addresses right there. So, that there. And EA, for example, is in the IE register bit 7. So that's a S bit right there. So we're looking here at SFRs are defined as a special function registers, they're 8 bit wide. If we have an S bit, that's a bit in the special function registers, and it's always going to be on the form the 8 bit name and then the bit number. That's the most significant bit in the global interrupt, or in the, in the interrupt enable register right there, which is 8 bits. The highest order bit is the global interrupt button. So if we go back to our program right here, right here. EA is equal to zero right there. Disable that there. So what we're saying is that IE bit 7 is equal to zero right there. Well, we just know that the interrupt enable, the global interrupt, is just EA, and that's all we have to remember. It makes our life much easier right there. We don't have to remember, all right, to enable the interrupts, I have to set bit 7 and the interrupt enable to a 1. To disable it, I have to set it to a zero. In C, we just have to remember that we set register EA equal to zero to disable all of our interrupts right there. So as you can see, programming in C is much easier. But 
having an understanding of what these registers are from doing it in assembly language makes it much easier to understand what the C is doing that there. That's why you gotta go through the assembly first, the pane first, and then we go into the C right there. So, okay, that there. So I'll review. Right there, internal data memory, there's 256 bytes right there. The first 120 bytes are both directly and indirectly interrupted. The upper 20, 128 bytes are can only be addressed indirectly right there. And then there's a 16 byte area that there. So this is just kind of where things are. Now, you can assign locations for variables where you want them to be stored, or you can just let the compiler do it. I normally just let the compiler do it right there. That there. And C, a declared variable can explicitly be placed in a certain area of memory. If no memory specifier is used, the compiler will place it wherever it wants to with the you know, given that there. So if we define int ADC result and we use a small model right there, it's going to be placed in the data space right there. If we place it compact, it's going to be placed in the internal data space, which is it up there. And remember that our chip has on it, it's got on it, it's got some memory that's actually internal, internal, and that's our 256 bytes, right? And then it's also got some memory that's internal, but, and my but is terrible, in the chip. Right there. So we address this as external memory. And then we've got also, we can have some memory outside the chip that we don't ever use right there. We don't use that for our projects right there. So what they're saying here is that our memory model only uses the data space that there, this variable is placed in the I data, then we got the extra that there. So we've got, now you need to tell the compiler at some point how much memory you've got that there so it doesn't overwrite the, the memory that there. So internal data, you got data, I data, and B data. The data specifies the first 128. The I data refers to all 28 mop that there. And the B data is your bit addressable data right there. So what we're saying here is that we can place something in data, I data, or B data. Or we can just leave that blank and just let it stick it wherever it wants to stick it right there. This just simply says that if we say data, it's going to be in the first 128 bytes. If we use I data, it's going to be somewhere in the 256, and if it's B data, it's going to be in the 20 to 20. Now, if you say status right there, that means those very that particular variable is bit addressable. It, if you want to use something that you can address and assign bits to it, in other words, a one or a zero for a certain location, it's got to go in B data. The data and the I data it doesn't really matter right there. So again, that there, and we can set bit flags that there, a bit that there is always going to be in B data, by the way, right there. So don't get too hung up on this. You won't use this very much. You won't use this hardly at all, this whole discussion right there, of where you assign your data right there. Because chances are, the only thing you're probably going to use is like, for example, if you use the bit type, it will, you should just know it's going to be assigned at some place in the B data the area that there. But you, you don't have to assign it to B data, the compiler will do it for you. Let the compiler do most of your work right there. That's all. That's the beauty of C, is the compiler will do a lot of this thinking for you. So, example here though, here is a case where we have a variable called status. It's an 8-bit variable. We told it we want to stick it in the B data area. Because it's in the B data area, I can assign a bit variable called S2 
and make it the fifth bit in the status rank variable. You would never do that in regular C, incidentally. You would almost never do that. You would just simply define a variable as boolean and let that take care of it for you out there. Out there. So you could not declare a bit pointer or array of bits out there. You don't have that option out there. So a bit value variable of 16 or 128 bits out there size. This limits the amount of bit value that the program can use. We're limited. We're not going to go over that limitation. There's a limitation there of 128 bits that that we can use in our that, that there because we've only got 16 bytes of bit addressable memory in this micro in this microcontroller, so we can't have more than 128 bit variables in our program. Yeah, most you're going to use is two or three in this class, so that's not a not not a limitation right there. So, external memory can be up to 64. Access to that there is very slow. Now again, that there there's two types of that there a bit data that there the X data refers to anything in the large 64 the default, and then that there and then you got the compact which that there. Chances are you're, you're, we're not going to use the large. We're going to stay. Our programs are small enough. We're not going to go outside the 256 that we've got that there. So access external is very slow because we have to use a 16-bit address to it. That there. Keep in mind that the 8051, we compare it to the ARM processors, the i5s, i3s, and i7s that Intel puts out, the AMD equivalent type processors. This is a slow processor out there. It's, I mean, our clocks are down in the two megahertz range versus the gigahertz ranges for some of these other processors out there. This is meant to be a controller type processor. It's not meant to do real data crunching. You would never write a web browser with an 80 to fit into an 8051. It just wouldn't happen. Or you can easily do a web browser for the ARM processor. I mean, actually. The ARM three or the uh, Raspberry Pi three, which it uses an ARM, actually is quite a co complex processor. That there, and you can run full let Linux on it, full version of Linux with web browsers, word processors, all that there. So, and that's just a very small ARM processor. So, in term, it's also a more expensive processor too. That there. That there. Okay, we've got our C has got our four. Uh, basic arithmetic functions right there. Multiply, add, divide. That there, and, we, and you should have learned that when you took computer programming. We also have our modulus, which we use more in in microcontroller processing than we do in my, that there. And then we also have the minus symbol right there, where we can negate returns the two's complement of a number right there. So, for example, in our counter right here is that unsigned we have 0f, count is equal to that, and we set the register equal to minus count. So that's going to send a negative number to that there, the two's complement. Now, we haven't talked much about the timers, but the way the timer works is every time there's an interrupt, it's going to increment our timer. When our timer gets up to FFFF, it overflows. And when it overflows, it generates a timer inter overflow interrupt right there. And that's what we use for our delay functions and things like that there. So however long we want to count, we want to set it to negative of how many counts we want. Because it's going to count up to back to zero right there. It's going to count up. So if we want to count five counts, we set it negative five. And that way, when it counts up five clocks, it's going to overflow. That there. So we always set our count on a minus number. That there. And this is our timer two, low eight bit register right there. Is what. Or it's actually, it's an eight bit register. Timer two reload value right there. So our we load timer two with negative count. That there, and that tells it how far to count before it overflows. Right there. So if we send it zero, then it will count its maximum number of counts. If we send it 
negative 50, it's going to count 50. If we send it negative 100, it's going to count 100 counts. If we send it negative 500, it's going to count 500. So we always send that a negative right there. But th we use that minus sign for that there typically. Again, that's a lot easier to remember and see. We have our basic four necks and while loops. So again, you can start seeing why C is more is, more, is much more preferable than using because we didn't do much looping in assembly language. Doing looping in assembly language is a pain in the neck. That there. Here we can use a for loop right there, or we can use an if statement and a while statement. These are the standard operators from C right there. Equal equal is the equal sign. Remember that you cannot say if x equal y bracket, and then here's your code, your end bracket, because if you say if x is equal to y, that's going to assign x equal to y, and then see if that's 1 or greater. If it's positive, then it's going to, or if it's not 0, then it's going to assume it true and then go through and do, do, do it every time. You have to do equal, equal right there. That's a common mistake right there. Same thing if we have a while x equal equal y, for example, right there. Normally, normally you would do that there. Or you say while x is less than equal to 500 right there. You could do something like that there. So we have those same loops and we're going to see examples of that there. And then we can do logical ands, ors, and nots right there. Again, these all evaluate. This is a very short introduction to see. Trying to jog some memory is what I'm trying to do here. If I find that I need to go through and cover more, then we'll cover more <laughs> right there. But these are our Boolean operations right there. And then we can do bitwise and right there. Now that does bit by bit. This here does a Boolean that there, where it evaluates the whole expression is true or false. This does a bit by bit. So, for example, A is equal to 0x zero, zero 23, which is 0010011. Zero, zero, one, zero, 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 one, one. B is equal to 0x. Zero, and I'm going to say 6, 7, for example, right there. Here, which that's, let's do 6, uh, 5, right there. 6, 5, right there. And that's going to be 0xx0010x, zero, x, x, zero, 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 right? So we do a bitwide operation, 0010011. Zero, zero, one, zero, 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 one, one. We do an and, bitwide and. We're going to come 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. We'll end up with 2, 1 right there. But it goes bit by bit is what the result is right there. And quite often you'll use that to clear a bit, for example. For example. If I want to clear a particular bit, I just hand it with a number that's that you know that's only got that bit that I want to clear as a zero. So, for example, if I want to, I'll just write here. If I want to clear a particular bit, say the least significant bit right there, so I would say C is equal to C handed with. 0, X, F, E, right there. E, of course, is 1, 1, 1, 0. So whatever, whatever was in that least significant bit in C is now a 0. I force it to be a 0. I clear that bit is what I've done that there. So we do bit operations to clear or set bits right there. If I want to set a bit right there, C is equal to C or, and I'm going to say 8, 0x80 zero zero, right there, that's going to set the most significant bit in C right there. And keep in mind that we may be turning around and say port 1 is equal to C right there. So what we're doing is turning a motor off in that case. If we set a bit, we may be turning a motor on right there. So that's how we would turn a motor on in a particular port right there. 
although we could just simply set a, an S bit right there. One of the things we can do is we can say S bit motor one equals P one bracket seven right there. So then I can just say motor one equals one and that turns that motor on. Motor one equals zero. That turns the motor off right there. So you can see where it's much easier to do things in C than it is to do it at there. Because now I've defined motor one and I said it's going to be port one bit seven right there. And that equates to a port on the board, right? And I can connect a DC motor to that right there. Actually, I would probably connect it through a drive transistor or something, but I can connect that motor right there. I could look at a switch. I can say S bit switch right there. And if I can write switch equals port zero bracket two, for example. And then later on in my code, I can say if switch equal equal one right there, do something right there. So that's looking at a switch that's connected to port zero on bit two. And if that switch happens to be closed, I can execute some instructions right there. Much easier than assembler right there. So I, I th hopefully you're starting to see why we're using C and why C works so well with hardware programming, but you still need, need to know what port zero bit two is. And that's easier to learn from the assembly language right there. So, all right. Right there, and go back to where we were at. Right there, okay. So a bit wise that there the this slide that there I don't think I put these slides up yet. I'll put them up after class that they're along with the lecture right there. So okay. Usage I've already turned turning bits on and off, toggling bits. I have not talked about toggling bits, but we could toggle a light right there. Now so for example if our LED and right there, our toggle is our right there is right there. If I wanted to turn our LED off right there, I could simply say port 0 dot 2 is equal to port 0 dot 2 and this says that port 0 dot bit 2 is equal to whatever port 0 dot 2 is on that there. So that turns the LED on and off right there. That there. So it's fairly simple where, where we're using the bitwise that in order to that there. Now again, we could define S bit bit LED equals to port zero rack carrot two up at the top, and we could say LED is equal to dot LED right there, and that will toggle the bit right there. So all that does is just toggle the LED if it's on or off right there. So checking the status right there again what we're looking at is here we can do mass we're doing a mask and we're saying that there toggle one is on toggle flag dot one here's our flag variable we're looking at flag port bit one right there he uses the, the dot I'm using the carrot I think they're interchangeable. We may find that my carrot is wrong. <clears throat> that there, and we have to use the dot format. That there, it changes so much with compilers, right there. So, uh, there. So again, if flags and mask is equal equal to zero, that means the LED is off. If it's equal to one, not equal to zero, then it means that the flag is on. So what we're doing is we're looking to see if this bit is a one, right there. I'm excuse me, this bit here, right there. This is our mask right there. So our mask is going to be 0x02 in this case, right there. 
So mask is 0x02. We do it bitwise and and we see if it's a zero. If it's a zero, then we know that bit two, or bit bit one, excuse me, it's number two, but bit two, right there. The number two, right there, mask is equal to zero x zero two right there. Right there. Right there. But that's bit one right there. We're looking at bit one. If bit one is high, then it's not going to be equal to zero. If bit one is a low, then that's going to equate to a zero from this AND operation right there. So again, we're using this AND operation to check to see if a particular bit is high or low. And that's what I did earlier, only I was I did it slightly different. His way is a little cleaner, but he actually shows the command how we would test it right there. Right there. We can shift our data left to right. Right there, that's quite often used if we're going to read something in an 8-bit pair right there and we want to shift it out in serial right there we do this bit the shifting sometimes we multiply it by 2 by shifting it to the left we divide it by 2 if we move it to the right but the shift operation we don't use it very often that right there we do if we're if we're doing serial to parallel type operations at right there or parallel to serial serial we shift our data in one bit at a time and after we've got 8 bits we push it out as a parallel data. If we want to shift from parallel to serial, we load in our eight bits and then we shift it out one bit at a time. And then we look, we do it eight times and we read in our next eight bits right there. So for commit, so we use our our shifting a lot for converting serial to parallel that right there, because almost everything in our microprocessor is processed in parallel data right there, but. The world has moved to serial communications. I don't know if anybody's caught that. You're probably not old enough to catch that. Back in the days that I started, almost all communications was parallel because it was so much faster. But parallel has a problem and that's as you get the speeds up, it, it has what they call crosstalk and you're limited in speed with parallel data. So serial is actually past it. It's quicker. Plus, par serial only requires three lines. Transmit, receive, and ground. Parallel requires at least nine lines, the eight data lines plus a ground right there. So shifting, a right shift, a left shift, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about these right there. Okay, this is the compound out right there. The whole goal here is a review. For whatever reason, C decided to add these compound operations where X plus equals zero is the same thing as x is equal to x plus two. Right there. X plus equal two is the same thing as x equals two and we eliminate repeating the x that there. So it saves one keystroke. That's why people have gone to it that there. It's that there. I still tend to use the equivalent just simply because I started out in Fortran that didn't have this, that Pascal didn't have it, Ada didn't have it, and now C has it, and I still am not smart enough to use it all the time. Right there. So, right there. So, but you have that there. We also have, again, these are, they also work for our AND and our ORs and our XORs right there. They do the bit wide, that there, that there. They still work, that there. This has been added to the microcontroller version. You probably would never do this in a desktop application, right there. You almost never do bitwise ands, right there. And that kind of winds up this set of slides, right there. Unfortunately for you, I have another set to go through. Right there. And this one's a little, how am I on time? Oh, let's not start. 49 minutes. Okay. I've got enough time to go through that there. Since we're not going to have the afternoon class, if I go over today, that there. Because the other option is I quit now and we come back at 3 o'clock. And I don't think anybody wants to do that, right? You'd rather have me go another, you know, go for an hour and 15 minutes or so, right? That there. Okay. So let me go through the next set of slides. So, I'm, so we're actually not skipping this afternoon's lecture. We're combining them at there. So now, but next week, remember, we're doing labs, and we have to split the group in two. All right, let me go through interrupts. And 
This is going to be a kind of a quick introduction to interrupts. Up there. Have I talked about interrupts with this class yet at all? Anybody know the word interrupts? I don't think so. Because I know I didn't get to it in microprocessors. I didn't get to interrupts yet. And I know I haven't talked about this class. So we're talking about an interrupt. And the first thing is that they're interrupt organization, interrupt summaries, enable, disenable. I want to talk about what an interrupt is. An interrupt means the processor's executing a, a series of some code and something happens externally, causes the microprocessor to stop what it's doing and service that interrupt. A good example of that is I have an ex-wife that was a, that is a nurse. She, she's still a nurse, but she used to work at a I guess she still works at a hospital. She, that there, but she used to work at a hospital near where we lived, and I'd go. You know, I had the unpleasant task of going out and buying dinner for her quite often, and meeting her at taking it to her at, at the hospital. That there, sometimes I end up buying dinner for seven or eight people and, and taking it to everybody, but. Regardless, I've been to her hospital many times and observed the way the nurses worked. I also had the task of working at a hospital many years ago. That's how I put my way, way through school. I worked at a hospital gila, that there. So I know how to deal with crazy students because I know how to deal with crazy individuals to begin with, which was good training for dealing with, well, I won't say which ex-wife, <laughs> that there. But uh, regardless, uh, I've you know, I've spent enough time around hospitals out there, so I know what ner what a nurse's job is. Fortunately, I have avoided being in one in this, as a patient, other than last year. Last year was the first time I was in a hospital as a patient, and it was only for like two or three days out there. So, but regardless, if you look at a nurse right there, a, a normal nurse's job is that they do rounds, right? A nurse's job when they when they're doing rounds is they get up from their nurse's station and they walk around uh, five or six rooms that are assigned to that particular nurse out there and they check on the patients. Now that's now in computer programming we call that polling. The the concept of polling means that here's my five rooms right there and here's my nurse's stand right there. So the nurse would get up and she goes to this room and then to this room, this room, this room, this room, and then goes back and sits down, right? Then we call that polling. That would be going out and, from a microprocessor standpoint and checking this sensor, checking that sensor, checking this sensor, checking that sensor, this sensor, and then going back and executing the rest of my code right there. So polling requires that the nurse gets up and stands at that there. Now. Uh, the nurse over here, when she's not doing her rounds, has a series of tasks to do. Now we'll assume that this nurse is like the ones that I've seen in my experience in the U.S. and their task basically, basically is to sit and do nothing, so they're reading a book right there. So they're sitting there and they're reading their paperback trashy romance novel right there. And, I, and I'm being mean to nurses all over when I say that. They sit at their nurses' stand and read trashy romance novels. You know, you know they don't read anything serious up there. Up there. But you know, they're sitting there reading, reading their novel up there. And this room hits their call button. There's a button in this room that there, and there's been one in every hospital room I was in except for the hospital for Ron Gila. That, that there, and they didn't put one there because the patients would sit there and play with it all the time. Out there, but they would put in this call button right there. And the call button calls the nurse to the room and asks for service. It does initiate a polling sequence. They don't care about this room, this room, this room. They only care about the room that has generated the interrupt. That, that call button is the equivalent of an interrupt. That there. So when that nurse gets interrupted, she goes through a series of events. She may not know what she's, she's going through a series of events, but she's going to go through a series of events. The first thing she's going to do is she's going to stop or finish whatever she's doing. That there. You know, she's probably not going to finish her book or reading her book mid-page or mid-sentence. She'll probably finish the current sentence or page in her book, depending on how hardworking they are. If she's writing a report, she'll probably finish 
the one entry she's currently working on. So in microprocessor terms, you finish out the current instruction that it's being executed. That there, but you can finish your current operation right there. You don't, you don't finish the entire book. You just finish the current sentence that you're working on, and maybe if you're toward the end of the page, you might fit, read down to the bottom of the page. If you're working on a report, you don't finish your current report, but you might finish putting in the number you, that you're writing. So you don't stop immediately, you finish your current operation. Then you save your place. So if she's working on a report, she'll probably hit the save button if it's on a computer and minimize it. That the way if someone comes up to the computer, they don't start typing on her report. If she's working on a book, she's going to put a page marker in the book. Out there. But you're going to save where you're at so you know what to come back to, right? Out there. Then you're going to go service your interrupt. You know, she's going to get up from her station and she's going to go to that patient's room and she's going to see what needs to be done. And when you service the interrupt, you're going to implement in the microprocessor terms an interrupt service routine right there. We call it interrupt service routine. But you do a preset of operations. You know, if the patient wants a pillow, she walks over to the cabinet and grabs a pillow and brings it back. She knows what to do if her interrupt requires a new pillow. If the, if the patient wants dinner, she calls the, the, the uh, canteen and orders her dinner, the dinner up. If the patient needs pain meds, she goes back, calls the doctor and says, or she may check the order, if the order has op open for pain meds, so she'll just go ahead and give the pain meds. If not, she'll call the doctor and ask for an order for pain meds. But she does something to take care of the problem. But the first thing she's done is gonna, she's going to clear the button. She's going to clear the interrupt that there. She's going to switch off that, that there. Now when she's done with all that, she goes back to her nurse's station, picks up her book and finds her bookmarker and continues reading. If she's working on a report, she pulls it up and starts working where she is left off. That there. But she's done something to, re to keep track of where she was at right there. The same thing has to happen with a microprocessor when we have an interrupt right there. So with that said, that's what an interrupt looks like from a nurse's station right there. We could talk about a guard doing rounds and, a, and an alarm goes off in a particular building. Oh, there's all kinds of everyday applications that use interrupts you know, in order to have, you know, to tell you what to do. Something simple as setting your alarm clock is an interrupt, right? It tells you it's time to get up and go to work, right? Or go to class. That there. That's an interrupt. It definitely interrupts your sleep. That there. So, okay. That there. With that said, an interrupt is an occurrence of a condition that causes temporary suspension of a program while the condition is serviced by that there. So, going back to our nurse's station, the program that's being executed is we're re reading our sleazy romance novel right there. And a condition has occurred. A patient has pressed the call button right there. So we're going to suspend our normal pr program, which is reading the book, and service the call button right there. Interrupts are important because they allow a system to respond asynchronously to an event and deal with it in the middle of performing another task. What that means is that asynchronously means that it, the program can stop what it's doing and respond immediately. This patient doesn't have to wait till the nurse gets up and do her, does her next sex of rounds. It's, they get service right away. Now there are situations where interrupts are ignored. Has anybody ever flown internationally on a long flight more than three hours? Well, I've had too many times. And we have call buttons for stewardesses on the plane, right? If I push the buttons and the, nurse, and the stewardess comes to me and I say, I'm hungry, can, you know, can I get something to eat? She's liable to push the button to clear the interrupt and walk away and not give me any food. <laughs> that there, because they're going to serve everybody in the next 15 minutes, and her basic response is, wait until you get served, right there. So, but regardless, they allow service immediately to sit out there. If I want a glass of water, and it's probably... 30 minutes before she's going to bring me water, she might bring, bring me a glass of water. 
I don't have to wait for 30 minutes until they walk out of the flight with the water bottle or the glasses. Stuff there. So I can get a glass of water immediately and not wait for the next time they do the polling. That there. So that there. it gives the illusion of doing many things at the same time. Now, I will point right now that I've used both these points for final exam questions. So you might want to remember this slide. Right there. I'm just going to point out why are interrupts important. Right there. So interrupts are important is because they allow the processor to respond asynchronously to an event while doing something else, and they give the illusion of doing many things simultaneously. So this question was on last year's final exam, probably the years before, and probably will be on this semester's final exam. So you might want to remember this slide right there. So and I'll put these, these slides up. So the subprogram that deals with the interrupt is called an interrupt service routine or interrupt handler, right there. Again, that goes through you know, what is an ISR and what is it used for. I typically use the term ISR as an interrupt handler, right there. So you know, like I said, there are different interrupt service routines for different situations, right there. So for example, our nurse, would behave differently if the interrupt is a machine that's monitoring the heart, the heart rate all of a sudden senses that the heart has stopped beating, they would probably not go get another pillow for the patient. They would respond differently than that there. Now interrupts also have priority, we'll talk about that later on. So interrupts execute that there generally performs an input or output operation right there. It normally does something if it senses a fire in a room, it might turn on an alarm, it might turn on sprinklers in the room in order to put the fire out, it might turn off the electricity to the room in order to prevent you know, damage to you know, equipment, it might do a number of different things right there. If, a, if an interrupt senses a door is open right there, it may just light a light on the, on the guard shack right there. But that there, or it may sound an alarm if it's out of that there. So it does different things. So when an interrupt occurs, the main program temporarily suspends suspension and branches to the SIR. Again, that we talked about with the nurse. She puts the book down, goes to the patient's room. That there. Performs the desired operation. That there and that that there. And again, the desired operation may be different depending on what type of interrupt it is. Right there. And different pieces of equipment or different Devices, different inputs can generate interrupts. We have multiple interrupts right there. Right there. And returns from interrupt instructions. Now, the return from interrupt instruction is the assembly language instruction. When we do, a gener do an interrupt in C, we, will ju we just simply label the subroutine as an interrupt and what interrupt it routine it is, and then the compiler will, will put in the return from interrupt right there. But I'm just going to talk about interrupts in general that there, and we'll talk about the C implementation later, right there. So this is what happens here when an interrupt occurs. We're executing our main code. We're reading our novel, right there. So this is, we don't care what we're doing, we're executing our program. And our program could be doing absolutely nothing. It could be in a while one loop. As a matter of fact, I think the example I use is a while one loop right there. When an interrupt occurs, the first thing we do is we push the program counter onto the stack. The stack we have not talked about much, but the stack is a place in memory set aside for temporary storage of, very, of, of data out there. And it's used pre predominantly by subroutines and Whenever we call a subroutine, it pushes information on the stack. When an interrupt is called, it pushes interrupts from the stack. So, that there. So, the push, the program counter, and the pop of program counter occurs on a call function as well. That there. In other words, if I say A is equal to X, Y, Z, A, B, C, and this is a function call, and I'm assuming you remember what a function call is from your, from your pro computer programming class of not will go through a function call again, but we call a function, it's always going to push the program counter onto the stack right there. 
Now, the next thing is not done in a normal function call. This is unique to a, to a interrupt routine, is that we push the registers onto the stack. This is unique to ISRs right there, interrupt service routines. That there, And the reason we push the registers onto the stack is that we don't know what the program was working on when we call it. Because the interrupt occurs at any point in time. If we're calling this, that, that there, we pre plan that, and any data we need is already stored before we call that, and then we come back, A, B, A is then and, and initialized right, with the right data. We don't need to put the registers on the same. But we could be in the middle of a loop, we could be in the middle of another subroutine, we could be in the middle of anything we want to be into, and this interrupt occurs. So we have to store the status of the microprocessor. It has to be stored. Then this is our code that we write. And I'm sorry here, folks, but I'm talking with my mouth. <laughs> there. But this is our interrupt service routine. This is the code that we write to service our, our, our interrupt right there. When our interrupt is done and we come across our RTI right there, or the end of our interrupt service routine in C, then we pop that there. Now these, this here and this here, we don't have to include in our code. That is done automatically. We only worry about writing the ISR right there. Right there. So, but it, it's important to know if we write especially assembly language programs that if we use the stack, it has to be left the same place it was, otherwise the computer gets my computer gets confused and goes back to the wrong place. That there, and if we change anything on the stack, we might screw things up. Now, that there. So it is that there. I do know so some programs would modify the registers on the stack deliberately. They get into it and they will change various registers. You really need to know what you're doing if you're going to do that. <laughs> Because you have to understand which, which registers are placed in which order and which what's the exact offset is to the reg, to the pro stack pointer to the each to a particular register. And it's, you really have to understand the assembler much deeper than we covered <laughs> that there. So I would say for the most part, if you're going to write assembly language programs that use interrupts, just stay away from the stack. Don't use the stack at all. In your, in your interrupt service routine. And since I haven't explained the use of the stack, that's easy for you, right? That there. So, but you, that there. So this is what happens. We, then we pop the program counter and go back to our main routine. So this is the sequence of events right there. And again, I've also used this as an exam question. Boom, right there. So interrupts is actually part of the final exam. So this lecture is, you know, I combined it with the C one, but this one is probably Studying for the final exam, the second half of today is more important than the first part. part. The, but the first part is more important for the labs we're going to be doing. That there. Okay, we have 22 different interrupt sources right there. We have four external. Those are pins that we assign on our microcontroller that when we take them low, they will generate an interrupt right there. We have five that are assigned to the timers. We have five timers. Actually, I think we're, we only have four on our, our microprocessor. But uh, each of our timers will generate an interrupt right there whenever they overflow. And then we have two serial ports if we're going to use a serial port. That there. In other words, if as we load in our serial port, as soon as we get a full buffer, it generates interrupt saying there's data to be read, read the data, process the data, and then it allows the next byte to be read into the serial port. If we're transmitting, you know, it's saying that the data has been transmitted out there and we're ready for the next byte right there. Because remember, if we're using our serial port, serial is one bit at a time, we load it in a parallel fashion, then it's got to be clocked out according to the baud rate over the next eight bits. And once the eight bits are out, then it's ready to do the next that there. So. Each interrupt has associated with an interrupt pending flag in the SFR so we can check to see whether an interrupt has occurred. Not there. When a peripheral or external source meets a valid interrupt connection, not there. 
right there. The associate interrupt impending flag is set to one. Their level sensitive means that if a flag is not cleared by the in the interrupt service routine, either by hardware or software, the interrupt will trigger again. So the first thing you have to do is you have to clear the flag, clear the interrupt. All interrupts are disabled and then enabled by. So by default, the interrupts are all disabled, right there. So if we're going to use interrupts, we have to turn them on, man. We have to turn them on and use them deliberately, right there. And that's to prevent, especially our external interrupts or our timing interrupts, when we power up and they just operate free flowing, they start interrupting the processor and we haven't initialized them right there. There's one interrupt that we cannot ignore right there, and that's our reset. You have a reset button on your processor, and its interrupt vector is 0000, zero, zero, zero. top priority, independent flag. It's always enabled, and it's always the highest level. Now, we have, for example, our priority control here. These are listed down the highest to lowest priority right there. So if two interrupts occur at the same time, then the highest priority has occurred. Or if it's servicing a higher order interrupt, it's going to process it before it does the lower interrupt, priority interrupt up there. So we have our external interrupt here, our timer flow interrupt. Now this is the address in which the interrupt service routine goes to when an interrupt occurs. Now normally the only thing you store there is a go to. Up there, a jump, a long jump to wherever the interrupt service routine is. If you write in C, you don't have to worry about that. If you write in assembly language, you have to pre, you have to load the interrupt service routines yourself. The C compiler, when we write a, an interrupt in C, will actually place the, write the code and stick it at the top of code, the code in that location there. But if if you remember when we ran any of our assembly language pr routines. The assembler assigned the start address for our starting routine. And when we started running, it went to address 200, right? That there. It always went to 200 in the program memory. It didn't put it at the top of memory. Right there. And that was to leave room for these interrupt, these interrupt service routines right there. So, that there. So if I'm going to write a timer one interrupt routine, I write the timer one interrupt service routine, and then I place at the top a jump to that. Out there, so out there. So I'm not going to get into that, but this is where how the compiler keeps track of the interrupts right there. It places the code for each interrupt in this location. Out there. That way, when timer one overflows, it goes to location one B automatically and starts executing code if the timer one interrupt is enabled. So we have to enable the timer one interrupt for it to recognize it out there. So that'd be the equivalent. The nurse has to turn on the panel, the, you know, her light panel right there. So that's there. So we have multiple ones out there. As you can see, there's multiple pages of them right there. Two pages of that there. You don't have to memorize this. This is not on the final <coughs> page. That there. You don't have to memorize it. But this is just a series. If, but these are important to know what they are, especially if you're going to write an assembly language, then you have to know what these are. But that's a practical matter. You look them up when you need to know them. You wouldn't put these in the memory. I don't. I have not ever began to try to memorize this right there. So, in the occurrence of two, the fixed priority and the two priority levels, we have, for example, we can set the priority the two different priority, low or high priority for some of these, right there. So, interrupt priority one, two, three. If there's some of these, we can change the priority level that there. So, again, I'm not going to worry so much about priority in, in this class. Up there. Each of the interrupts are in, individually inter, enabled or disabled through three special interrupts that there. The original 8051 only had IE. It only it only serves like four or five interrupts. Now we got 22 interrupts available to us. So in addition, we also have to set the global. So there's two bits that must be set to enable every interrupt. This final exam, 
right there. <laughs> I'll just point right there. That in order to enable an interrupt, you have to set two bits, and what are they? The individual interrupt, the individual interrupt enable bit, and the global interrupt enable bit. That there. Some require more than two. Most require only two. Right there. And then of course, interrupt zero cannot be turned off, and it's always the highest priority. That's the reset button. Right there. Right there. I'm not going to worry about uh, interrupt priority levels. That there. I, I'm not going to worry about that. That's. It's important, but not for this class. That there. So again, that there. So again, example they give the current to, to the motor has to be adjusted accordingly. This is done on a timer interrupt. That there. We set that to a high priority. That there. The for, the buttons that they're on the forward reverse remote control are low priority because they, you know a few milliseconds is not going to make a difference when somebody hits the reverse or forward button up there. But in, 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 in uh, using the timer to spend, send pulse with modulation or something to the tires, wheels to drive the car, then that has to be done precisely. So we set the timer to high priority and the forward button, again we're not going to use that so much in this class. That there, same priority, the fixed priority, that there, again, I'm not going to worry about that. Okay, some interrupt flags are automatically cleared when the CPU modes are not clear and you have to clear the interrupt service routine. General rule, the first thing you do in your interrupt service routine is you disable the interrupts and clear the pending one. That there. And then when you're done, you re-enable the interrupts. So you don't want to be interrupted while you're servicing the interrupt. Although there are some cases where you might want to re-enable, say, you know, other interrupts. For example, the nurse, she's getting the pill, the alarm goes off in room five where the patient's heart stopped beating. The heck with the patient that wants an extra pillow. Let's go and service the patient who's just died on the table right there. So there are some interrupts in that there. So the interrupt after that there completes the interrupt service, a new interrupt request will be generated. So this is what happens. If you don't clear the flag, it'll just keep calling it over and over again. But there you have to clear the flag. Otherwise, it'll just call itself. You know, I go get the pill and I don't clear the call button. I go back to the room and ask the patient what he wants. I go back to the room, oh, the light's still on. Go back and what, what do you want? Right there. You keep going back to the same patient because you forgot you were just there. I mean, we're, we're talking, you know, not so bright nurse that there. You know, so the first thing you do is you clear that call button so that if the button's lit, it's for a new interrupt. It's not, you don't keep servicing the same one over and over and over again. So you have to clear the interrupt flag for that one there. If an interrupt is disabled, it's completely ignored right there. If patient, the patient in room three keeps calling me every five minutes and I don't want to talk to him anymore, I reach over and unscrew his light bulb right there. So he can hit that call button all he wants and my light will never come on because I'm ignoring that patient. That's there. So, that, that there. So we can disable interrupts. That there and ignore them. That there. We have that option. That there. And sometimes it's important, right there, that we do that. Uh, external interrupts. These are enabled by the crossbar. We have not talked about the crossbar, but we would have to enable those through the crossbar and. Uh, and we're going to do that in a lab later, right there. And we have to go through, and we have to tell the crossbar that these pins on the chip are now assigned to interrupt zero and interrupt one. If you recall, our microprocessor has about 20 pins on it, right? Of which three or four we can't touch. There's VCC and ground and a couple others we can't do anything with. So we have about 14 pins if I recall that there. There's now a little bit more than that. That there. I think we have like tw I can't 18 pins I think available to us or something like that. I can't remember off the top of my head. That there. So if we if we want to use interrupts zero and one, we have to give up some pins on our microcontroller. That's there. So maybe we may not be able to use all of port two or port one. 
they're, they're, those pins are now assigned to interrupts right there. So, and you could do that with a, there's a program that comes with the, that they're called the uh, configuration wizard. We I haven't showed you that program yet, but yeah, you will see it, see it in the next week or two out there on how we would assign our interrupts out there. So we can assign interrupts to certain pins. If we push that button, it generates an interrupt right there. And you'll do a lab where we generate some interrupts out there just to see how to generate interrupts. And then how we can ignore the interrupts right there. So we, we, will, we will, will have a lab on interrupts. Our next lab is just simply going to be how to use the C compiler right there. So, right there. so those are configured that there. You know, we got the, that there. They're enabled. This just simply talks about the that there. We'll go into more detail on, with an example on how to do it, and how to read this. But we have our flags right there. They're configured by that there. We have our interrupt flags here. We can enable them with these two ports right here, IE.0.1 enables those particular interrupts right there. We set them to one, we will recognize if we set it to zero, we will ignore that there. So we will do a lab where we can set up a pin to rec you know, we set the pin as an interrupt, we go through a particular set of our code, we enable the interrupts every time we push the button or, or, or take the uh, wire to VCC or ground, you know, you'll see the interrupt generated and then we can ignore it to where you can move the wire all you want and it doesn't interrupt the processor. So we'll, we'll look at that there. And again, this is the register. We won't worry too about that because again, in C, all you have to do is remember these. You don't have to remember the bit numbers. That's all recorded. So timer, T, TF1 is timer of what's below one right there. External, external interrupts, uh, there's six and seven. We don't have these on our chip, right there. So those, we only have interrupt zero and one. Six and seven are for the higher order chips, like the F1, the F020, it's got 64 pins on it, so you got plenty of that there. And it's got port three. Port three is not on our chip, so we don't have interrupt six and seven, that there. It's in the family, it's talked about in the slides, but our chip doesn't have that on it. Right there, you have to have the bigger chip to have that there. Right there, again, this just gives the same information. That there, IE interrupt. That there, again, these are the interrupt enables, right there. And you got the whole table. And again, these tables are all important if you're at there. But you don't. I wouldn't put them to memory. If we need them. Well, I'll give you the information for the table that you need right there. Nobody memorizes these tables, or at least nobody with the right mind does deliberately. Somebody who uses this chip day in and day out, like, you know, I've worked on some projects where I've used the 8051 day in and day out. I started to memorize a lot of these things that there because I was using them all the time. I haven't used the 8051 on a daily basis for at least three years because I've been here three years almost, right there. And four years before that because I was chair of the mechanical and civil engineering department industrial engineering, so I wasn't doing any real work then. I was too busy, you know, supervising people and worrying about budgets and enrollments and all the things that a head of section does, it's not teaching classes, and not doing any industrial work, so I didn't use any of that. So it's been at least seven years since I've actually done any real work with the 8051. So all this stuff is gone from my memory here, yeah. right there. So all these tables up there. That's my discussion on interrupts up there. We will see an interrupt. We will see an interrupt, and I still only went about eight minutes over my normal one lecture, right? Right there. Uh, we will see next week. We will see a C programming lab right there, which we will break into two for that. So we'll have a morning afternoon section. I will try to get for the following week an interrupt lab right there and again there will be probably a 10 or 15 minutes discussion on how to do the lab before that there and I only record that for the morning or the noon session the afternoon session I won't record the same instructions twice but I'll repeat them for the afternoon section that there I probably ought to re record the afternoon one because that'll probably be cleaner because I'll make mistakes on the first one but uh, we'll have that for both 
next week and the following week. So we're looking at two lab sections. You will turn in a report for each of those sections, which will be right before the semester break. So I need to have a couple of assessments for the semester before the semester break. I'll probably combine the grades that there. Uh, we'll talk about the reports when I, you know, next, you know, when I go over there. The, the reports will have to be turned in and done individually, but you'll do the lab as a group. That there, and you'll do the labs in groups of. I'm going to say groups of three. Seems to be the ideal number. If I allow you, you'll do them in a group of ten. That there, but I'd say a group of three. In a more perfect world, a group of two. But since this is a large class and I have a lot of people, but the reports have to be written individually. So you, but your group will all have the same soft, same data, the same evidence. So I would expect all three reports to look very similar from your group, but. You know, when I go through there, I have to have individual reports from each person right there. And you'll be graded on your report as an individual, but the program, of course, is the same as your group, so that there. The program will be probably, there should be no reason you can't get it to work, because I'm going to almost give you the program, but your report's going to be explaining how the program works and why it's doing that there, and you know, your screenshots of, of what happened there, but we'll talk about that next week. So I will see everyone in a week, I guess, right there. But half of you during the first that there, and I think it worked out about half and half last time. I don't think I need to sign groups. I could actually go through and say, everybody on this side of the room come at noon, everybody on that side of the room come at 3 o'clock, but whatever time is more convenient, as long as I don't get everybody in one session right there. It, actually, looking at the attendance, I could almost get away with who's here because there's a lot of people not here right now, but tell your friends who are not here that they do need to attend next week because they will submit a report, and if they don't do the lab, they can't write the report because you'll put down a group number as part of your group that there, who your group partners are. So you just can't, you know, I don't want people to just steal data from somebody who did a lab and then submit that as a, a report. I, you know, you, you need to be here and do the lab. Otherwise, you get zero points for that. There and I don't remember how many points I allocated, like ten percent for you know for lab one, which I'm going to buy the next two is lab one. So it's like ten percent of your final grade is you do the next two labs that there, and that's a lot easier to get ten points by showing up and doing the labs and submitting the report because you're probably going to get the full ten points than trying to get ten points on the final exam. <laughs> that there, those are easy to labs are easy ten points in comparison to the final exam questions.